Are you ready to join me in transforming fear to freedom? That's the objective of the show. Are you ready to explore with me and my guests? Are you ready to get into the deep and play? This is where it's at, and that's what it's all about. No medical advice here. Use discernment and decide for yourself if the information is right for you. All views and opinions expressed on this show belong to the individual and are not necessarily shared with the producer of the show. Want more details? Go to Let's Get Real Chat with Catherine.com. Now let's get real and have some fun. Who are we going to explore with today? Come on with me and let's get into the deep. Welcome to Let's Get Real, Chatting with Catherine. Boy, have I got a show for you today. Um, It's actually such a show that I had to do it in two parts because it's a delicate subject. Imagine living for 35 years in secret, um, in hiding, changing your name 18 times, moving 50 times because of fear, because of threats to your life and those that you love. That's what happened to Joe Dibley. Joe Dibley is the author of Frock Off, Living undisguised. Now, Jo is an amazing woman and she is amazing in many ways, not just because of what she lived through, but because of what she's done since she decided to take her frock off. And Jo explains what frocks are in the video. So, um, but basically what we're talking about here is the secrets, the secrets that perpetuate more and more um, hurt and more and more wound. Hurt people hurt people and broken systems create broken people. And we have a lot of broken systems right now. And we had a lot of broken systems when she was growing up. Her dad came back from World War II with post-traumatic stress. And it was never um, really treated. And so in her family, she grew up with poverty. She grew up with all of the symptoms that happen, all of this, the ripples, um, the effects that happen from somebody who has a mental illness in the family and it's not addressed. And... I think it speaks to something that's been going on in this country for some time, and that's the dismantling of our healthcare system. We had a beautiful universal healthcare system which also addressed mental health. And although I don't think that um, we are there yet as far as understanding mental health, but it's like we're not there yet on a lot of different illnesses and diseases, but it doesn't mean we don't need to talk about it and we don't need to... um, address the the things that are happening the uh, to the families poverty is another one um these are things we're living in 2015 and a lot of these things are just really affect the whole community they don't just affect the children the children that go to school broken and hungry um coming from a home that is violent and so forth or you know the foster homes that those systems um it was in a foster home that Joe Dibley experienced her um, most horrific event and the event that actually took her into um, living this life on the run and in hiding. She talks about that. And the reason I really wanted her to talk about it is because she is one of the lucky ones in the sense that she survived it in order to speak to it and to change. And she changes the world by living her example of what she calls a frockalicious life. And she holds events called Frockalicious Events. And those events help other women, especially women. And she also helps men, but particularly women, to take the frocks off, to live the life that they were really destined to live, and to let go of the secrecy and the fears that are holding them back. And it happens all too often in this country, and I think that's why it's important to have the conversation. And Jo was great about doing that. Her book is an international best-selling book. She has won numerous awards. She was recently awarded uh, by the Reader's Favorite a um, bronze medal for True Crime, Hope, and Inspiration for the internationally best-selling book, Frock Off, Living Undisguised. And she is she is just an amazing woman, but when we listen to her story, you know, you can hear the voices of so many women who never got to speak, children who haven't had the chance to speak. We still have many missing, missing people in this country. And it's not, as far as I'm concerned, really being addressed because we're not talking about it because we think if it doesn't happen to us, it's not happening. Well, the reality is, I think in a lot of cases, it is happening to us because no man is an island. We live in communities 
on this planet. And so anytime one one part of it's like your body, anytime one part is sick, your whole body is it, feels it. And that's how it is on this planet right now. So Joe's story is an important story. It's an important um, story in so many ways, but not just to hear her. <clears throat> I always think it's important to hear, to listen to people's stories, but it's also important to see where all of these broken systems are in our society so that we can do our best to uh, address them and not let this happen to one more person ever. So this is done in two parts. We start off with hearing her story and the um, places that it broke down and what she had to live with. And I think it's an important one to hear. So I encourage you to share it with your friends, to share it um, you know, with your family, and to start having the conversation yourself, which Joe addresses as well. Um, you know, have the conversation with your family. Um, those secrets that are holding you back, um, if that's all it is that's holding you back, realize that you're not alone. It's it's true, you know, we all think our story is, is so horrific and so much blame and shame is put on the victims and it's time for us to stop doing that, to stop. We, we have to stop. It's time for us to recognize that um, when something happens to us, it's not our fault and that um, telling the story doesn't make the victim the bad person. The, you know, it's, it's an interesting uh, psychological uh, um, tool that's been used for years and eons, really, on, on humanity. Um, when someone does something wrong or inappropriate and then the person that um, is the victim of that believes that they have to keep the secret. And that's just absurd. But we know it's a pattern. And <clears throat> in, excuse me, in Joe's case, there was a lot of things that broke down. So we're going to get into that conversation. As I said, this is part one. Look for part two. Subscribe to us on YouTube so you make sure you don't miss part two. And in part two, she also talks about the Frockalicious events, some of the other people that are helping her to put them on, and um, where they're at, and, and more information on the website, and um, where she's donating uh, funds from book sales, um, a portion of it, to, to these uh, two charities in particular, uh, Little Warriors and Because I Am a Girl. So it might be something for you to check out as well. Let's get at this important conversation right now. I'm for a chat with Joe Dibley. Am I saying your last name properly, Joe? You are. Okay. You are. This is, Joe is the author of Frock Off, Living Undisguised. And do you have a copy of your book there, uh, Joe, so you can... <laughs> Very proud of this book, uh, yes. Story of My Life. Yes. And oh, uh, hard-earned yeah. book as well. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, I, you know, as I, in, in the introduction, I mentioned, you know, some of your awards and so forth. But for me, um, even though I haven't actually read the book yet, which I intend to, it's on my list for sure. What I think is the biggest award is that you came out of that situation. That is the biggest award is that you reclaimed your life. So welcome to the show, Joe. Thank you. I'm so excited, Catherine. And I have to, you know, I just have to thank you for all the support and more so even for all that you do and to help us share our message because, you know, collectively we can be that change. Individually, I can't do it by myself. I have this big dream, but I can't do it without support and help. So thank you for all that you're doing, my dear. I uh, appreciate it. You're very welcome. And I totally agree with you. It's Many hands make light work, and, and that's the only way we really ever are going to um, get things done. So when the book came out, you came out of the frocked life um, mm -hmm. in 2007. It was when um, you say that that's when you said enough. So let's backtrack a little bit, and if you want to, if you can give us a little, uh, I don't want, you know, giving away the whole book, because I do want people to read it, because I think it's the kind of tender book that most of us would probably want to read um, because it might bring up our own um, situations or people we know, um, that kind of thing. But where did, you know, you're the daughter of um, the firstborn of your mom and you're the 10th for your dad. And you're, it sounds like you, you started off life in, in a sort of a, a poverty situation. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It was very precarious, to say the least. And, uh, you know, the, I started out 
I guess as some would say, behind the eight ball. Mm -hmm. But the reason that was, is both of my parents were not well. My dad had post-traumatic stress disorder from serving in World War II. And back then they didn't know, so they would send the person home thinking that if they took them out of the situation, they would get well just by virtue of not being, you know. And we know nowadays as there's more and more stuff with PTSD that that isn't actually even the case because unless we get them support and help, it doesn't go away. And if anything, it magnifies because they land back home where everyone's living a normal life. Let's just use my dad returning from Europe. In any event, there was a, a significant age difference between my parents. So keeping in mind, he's suffering PTSD. My mom has to leave home when she's 13. Uh, and the reason being is that her uh, stepfather, unfortunately, took advantage and actually raped her twin sister and left her bloody, bruised, and basically unconscious in a closet. And her mom, and keep in mind, there's like we're talking severe mental illness here, okay? So it, it's, it came through the family. And her mom would not believe the sister, and it's mom's twin. So you can imagine, if you know anything about twins, you know what this looks like. This isn't just, not to say that a sister relationship isn't valuable or isn't, you know, in our yes, heart, yeah. that, or another woman, but the truth of it is, is you, we know that twin sisters or twin brothers, twins, are, yes. they're so connected, it's at the cellular level, and so if I feel something and I'm the twin, you're going to feel it if you're my twin. Yes. So my mom knew she was next on the list because he basically told her. So she left home at 13 and, and hitchhiked from Barrie, Ontario to Toronto. That's about 60 miles. Yes. Um, and if you understand just that concept of her leaving home at that age, which we all can understand, if any of us have children, you can't fathom putting your 13-year-old out on the street and say, go find your way in Toronto, which at the time would have been a big city. Anyway, right? Oh, and absolutely. For- and grade eight, I mean, that's like, you're just, some some young girls haven't even got their menstrual cycle yet. I mean, exactly. they're still, they're sort of on the cusp of being, being a woman. They're not even there yet, really, 13. Exactly, exactly. And mom's twin was a fraternal twin. So there was a, you brought something up really important there with regards to her not even being, even in that frame of mind yet. So uh, her sister was. She looked, there's about a five inch difference between them in height. And, uh, you know, we, we've joked you and I about our height <laughs> or lack our thereof. Lack, of, lack thereof, <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. And uh, short version of that story is my mom was quite tiny. And any in any event, she didn't arrive as a young woman. She basically arrived still as a young child, at least looking. She was lucky someone took her in that was a diner owner who... I think probably took wayward girls in quite frequently, Mm -hmm. had them work in the restaurant and mom lived upstairs and she was safe about five years later. So for five years, she did pretty good. She lived in this. I mean, she would tell me stories about 33 cents an hour and how most of her wage went to her rent above the restaurant, but she got fed and she had a safe place to sleep and no one to take advantage of her. And so all things be equal. Pretty cool. Yeah. She meets my dad. My dad is still very not well and she, mom has her own issues because she's had to leave home at 13 and uh my dad over time my mom falls in love with my dad he was she thought he was worldly because he'd, he'd been to europe um, and uh anyway my dad gets my mom into prostitution so i am yeah so it was a big thing right uh it, a big thing on so many levels my mom wants to help my dad because by the time she meets him, he has nine kids. That's why I'm number 10. In actuality, I'm not my father's daughter. I am my dad's oldest son's daughter, meaning my half brother would actually be my father. And did you know this? I didn't know it till much later. As a kid, I found out as a kid. uh, And it was really, really hard, as you can imagine. Yes. Uh, But so the, when I came into the picture, aside from being born into extreme poverty, I was born into extreme mental illness, okay? So my parents, you know, and I refer to my dad as my dad because he's the person that raised me. Yeah. And I didn't find out till I was about 15 what had happened with mom and him. And they used to refer to it as being in the business. So quite often I'll joke and say, well, of course I'm an entrepreneur. I came into this world by the oldest profession. Why wouldn't I be an entrepreneur? I mean, what else should I be? Can you see me being an accountant? That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I started out. That is right. Oh, that's the 
best way to deal with this stuff, But isn't it though? true? It's mm-hmm. true. It's like, true. Instead of hiding it, sweeping it, right? So anyway, fast forward, it, it was, um, it was a, it was very tough. My parents weren't well and, and things just keep, kept escalating. And so, you know, between the poverty and the mental illness and them trying to give us away at times, just because they didn't know what to do. So did you all live um, together, the nine brothers and, or the nine? Uh, the nine other children and you some of them some of them uh the older brothers that the one would be my dad um and some of the older sisters lived with us and of course you, they aged out right because you yep. think of it my dad's 20 years older than my mom which means one of my sisters and my mom were pretty much the same age right right so they, I mean, they were with us and then they would have, the, we had a point where we kind of probably looked like we lived on a commune, um, you know, the, the shots had hit the building, but anyway, yeah. that's another story. Yeah. Um, so, you know, they aged out because they had their own family. So some were and some weren't, and there were times probably when everyone was there, but I don't remember all of that. I remember a lot of them being there. I don't remember every single one being there at the exact same time. If was, that makes sense. What, was anyone else, did, did you ever get the sense that anyone else knew that anything was wrong? Or did you at that time ever, did you ever get a sense of looking maybe at the neighbors or going to school or ever get an idea that there was anything different about your family? No. And I'll tell you why. Our norm is our norm. So I meet people every day that say, you know, Joe, I had this trauma happen to me and, and, or, you know, mine isn't as bad as yours, which drives me crazy. Cause here's the truth, whatever cross we bear, whatever sadness or sorrow we've had to overcome, whatever challenge, that's all we know. We that's don't right. know anything else. But what I did, in fact, there was a, there's a point in the book where I talk about a girl from across the street that lived in a really, really nice house, wanting to come and live with us. And, I thought that made logical sense. We didn't have food. I couldn't go to school some days because there was no clean clothes and no food, right? And like, there's a whole bunch of stuff around that, it, you know. It and it's it's quite drawn out in the book. It shares all this, but the bottom line was, we only know what we experience until we're out of it, and then we start looking at things. And I always came at everything, Catherine, from a place of hope and faith and love and I didn't see what other people I bet you people in my family did because when I hear stories from them they see things very differently than me I just remember thinking this This is like this is my family this is who you know this is who we are yeah right I get that I I really get that because I I know I I remember um, you know different kids I went to school with that um, you know you thought I that oh that looks good over there and that looks good over there and that doesn't look so good and and, you know not never even thinking about your own situation and whether it's good or it's not good you just this is what it is it is what it is and I so it brings me to the question is that within the where did you get the idea that you needed to keep secrets so even though for myself I knew or I felt, I guess, I felt loved, or that I was hopeful, mom or dad or other people would say to me, you can't share this because you could be taken away from the family. For example, (laughs) right, I get, there's a point where I have to go to the hospital because I'm peeing blood. Sorry to be so graphic, but that's the easiest way to say it. And I have a horrific urinary tract infection. And we had a chamber pot. We didn't have running water. We didn't have any of that indoor plumbing thing. Woo, I now have a toilet in my house. I've already, uh, you know, a million times better off. I'm just saying, like, you know, it all it's all relative where you come from, yep. right? Yeah. And anyway, I remember, and the pain was so horrific when I would have to go to the bathroom. And I remember screaming and my mom, like, stop screaming bloody murder. Those were her sayings, right? And um, anyway, when we went and the nurses and the doctors were like, she has to stay in the hospital. She's really sick. And my mom and dad both said to me, don't say anything about food or anything like, you know, don't talk about home life because these people, they're not, they're basically out to get us. Remember, they're paranoid and they're not well. And so it wasn't, um, it wasn't, 
me dreaming up something because I didn't know any different. And so I go into this and I'm thinking, well, why are they like the nurses were really nice to me. Everybody was nice to me. Of course, I was that girl that they thought needed protecting. And, but I'm not telling anything. I'm told not to. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah. But they, I mean, <clears throat> there's all kinds of signs, obviously, that they're aware of. But you're not. And, and that thing is like you're normal and it's your it's your security, even though it could be what's killing you, um, your home so, life. It's your security. It's what you know. It's all you know. And unfortunately, it seems that's a big part of our human condition, even at a very young age, that <laughs> we um, will choose what we know as opposed to the promise of something better. And we wouldn't even know what better was anyway, other than no. to not have pain. I mean, if you're like this, you're in the hospital, you're probably thinking, yeah, I'd like this pain to go away. You know, that would be it. It was pretty cool to sleep in a hospital bed. Like, you have to understand where I was coming from, right? I thought it was so clean. Not that my parents weren't clean. I don't want to imply that. My mom, I'm a big bleach fanatic because to me, when I smell bleach, it reminds me of clean. Yeah. Okay. But to have my very own bed and the bed moved and I mean... The things that you would think of would be scary to me were really cool, yeah. right? I missed my family. Yeah. Um, but I, I never, ever told mom again when I had infections. It wasn't until when I had horrific, horrific urinary infections my whole childhood. I would just, it would eventually just work itself out. And it was horrendous. As a result, you know, I ended up in the hospital lots as a teenager because so much damage to my urinary tract. Yeah. And um, I was told I would never, ever be able to have children. Now, that didn't transpire. I have, I birthed, I, you know, gave birth to two children and I acquired my bonus son, but that's another story. Anyway, um, yeah. So, so I, was, I mean, that, that's rather miraculous then in, in the, that you would have been able to have children after absolutely, all that many absolutely. years of, of that kind of infection. So, so you weren't ever in, uh, in the sense <clears throat> as you were, you didn't know, as you say, you're normal. You didn't know that you had to be quiet at mm -hmm. that point, um, no. but you did know not to tell at the hospital. So that, yes. that, that would be sort of a beginning of a certain mentality. You was, you, at, at that point, you would probably be at some level getting an idea Hmm. maybe we're not the same as everybody. We're not allowed to talk about yeah. all these other things, right? Or or maybe you might have just thought oh, it's an institution, like it's it's not like a, somebody's house. So in that kind of place, you don't tell things like that, you, you know, as a child. So so from there, you, um, as you say in, 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 in your bio, when I, you moved, what, 50 times and changed your name 18 times. So when did that start? So, you know, fast forward to when I'm a teenager and finally, uh, and not finally as a slam to social services before I say this, but finally, mom and dad referred to social services as wealth, the welfare, uh, the welfare people stepped in and they offered me an opportunity just to be a kid for one weekend. By now, I knew there was lots of trauma in our family that something was wrong, but I took on the role of parenting them from about 12 years old. Okay. And, and I certainly wasn't telling anybody anything because yeah. I knew we'd be separated. Who's going to take four of us all at once. And I'm old at that point, meaning, you know, in the scheme of things. Yeah. Uh, also, who's going to take care of your parents? Exactly. And my parents at that point had tried several times to take their own lives. And I had witnessed and been, you know, in intensive care with both of them at one point, you know, not at the same time, but at alternating times. And so I'm not telling anything, but, you know, people are starting to step in. The school's going, something's not right here. I mean, we've got this bright kid. She's, you know, straight A student, but things, and I, I really was withdrawn. I, I was not withdrawn in, as in depression. I could, I didn't talk to people because I didn't want anyone to find out. And by now, I, you know, as a teenager, you're already embarrassed by just because you're a teenager. Yeah. Under normal circumstances. Yeah. So, anyways, they did step in. And again, fast forwarding, I tell a lot more in the in the book about this. But uh, they stepped in and they said, "We just want to give you a break, Joe." Like, you go and you go be a kid for one weekend. And the first thing that came out of my mouth is, who's going to take care of my siblings? Because mm -hmm. I'm worried about them. Mm -hmm. I don't want them left alone with mom and dad. Mm -hmm. And they promised me there's going to be a home care worker who comes in. And that does happen. Beautiful woman who just 
salt of the earth, never judges. She goes, she's there with them for the weekend. And you know that weird feeling you get when you go somewhere and you think, Something's not right. don't feel safe. But who am I to tell you what's safe? I'm coming from a place where I don't know when I walk in the door. That's really when I started the whole frock up, frocked off, frock this, frock that languaging. Because I, it was my mechanism for coping, right? And so during that year, I had, you know, just so people understand, a frock to me is a costume or it's armor. It's something we put on and it could be against beliefs or attitudes or what have you. In my case, it was for all things, whether it was physical or emotional, anything. Right. And so I don't know if you guys can see this, but I would literally pretend I was put, I would stand outside my door of our house and I would pretend I was putting on my armor. Wow. And to me, it seemed completely normal. Right. Like I didn't realize that normal, that this was not normal because I had got to a point where it was so tr there was so much trauma in our house and not because my parents were mean to us. They weren't. Well, I'm not defending or abstaining. I'm not saying anything. I'm not saying it's OK. I'm saying this is how it worked. Yeah. Okay? And, you know, so I, we have this is that what it was. They were sick. They loved you. You love them. That's how it is. And that's exactly. the hardest part about coming out with a story like this for anybody and that's why I'm I was so excited about doing this show with you for you know I'm all about exploring higher visions but it's uh, it's that's not just to to talk about you know pie in the sky we gotta talk about what's going on what has gone on in order to heal in order to and you know it breaks my heart to hear your story but at the same time you know I have my own we, exactly. You know, and we, we, we do and we protect those stories because we love our parents, because we love our, you know, our, our family. But yeah. a lot of people have these stories and I'm, and I would say probably more people than we think, you know, oh, and, and exactly. that's, so that's part of this frocking is that the illusion that you kept this for 35 years. So yeah, exactly. And so, you know, that whole putting on that armor to, to, to stay safe yeah. applied to everything in my life. Okay. Right. So it just, it's just kept growing and growing. But when I went to this, um, when they took me for that weekend to give me this break, I went to a foster to two people that were supposed to be, were touted as the best foster parents in Penticton. And I knew the feeling as we pulled up to that house was so dark. I would say that I'm somewhat intuitive, but only with myself and with people really close to me. Mm -hmm. And I've had to be to stay alive, to be quite yeah, honest. Absolutely. And knowing, you know, and sometimes even though I have this ability, sometimes the rational side or the irrational side even takes over. But anyway, fast forward, I got out of the car and I, I just, but I went in and I thought, well, they can't be all that bad because they had tea and cookies, which I'm a tea drinker, hence the reason I'm double fisting with a glass of water and some tea to balance out the caffeine because it's real tea and it's real caffeine. But there's nothing else I'd show you. But anyway, back to that. <laughs> um, I thought, well, these guys can't be that bad because they have tea and cookies and we didn't always have food. Right. So, right. So I go in and I think it's just a weekend and nothing happened that weekend. Yet the whole time I felt uneasy. And then the um, foster dad asked me if I babysat. I said, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm raising my sisters. I actually would turn down dates if there was a baby to babysit, like a brand new baby. I loved kids. I've always loved kids. Yeah. And so uh, long story short is a few months later, he called me and asked me if I'd come babysit. And I thought, well, you know, at this point, I had now stopped questioning these people because I thought even when I went that when I left there on the Monday morning and went to school and nothing had happened I thought you know who am I to say I come from crazy bill right yeah. so and, you, and you're not now you're not trusting your intuition now yeah. you're, you're thinking somehow I made a mistake Absolutely. because I, because because I'm coming from crazy bill I'm overreacting to you know which yeah. when you're actual your intuition was Probably Bang. very, very good. Yeah. And so I go, sorry, he calls me. I said, yes, he comes to pick me up. And as the truck, as I'm going towards the truck, I can feel it again. And I think, 
You're just being ridiculous. Right? I know not to get in that truck, just so you know. I know. Uh, every part of me is don't go. The other part of me is it's a babysitting job. And, and you know, I have to earn all my own money for all stuff. And that's fine. I'm, I'm at that age. I don't think there's anything wrong with that, actually. But in the situation, there, it's not that. It's the fear is, is over. Anyway, I go... And he has no intention of me babysitting. And it's a long story. It's better drawn out. And it's better written or told in the story. But the short version is he assaults me. I am fortunate to get away from him. And he stalks me for months. He tells me if he gets me alone, he's going to finish the job. Well, he'd already done what he needed to do. But he meant take my life. Uh, I don't tell anyone. I don't tell my parents. He tells me he'll kill my sisters. He'll kill anyone I love. I know he's telling the truth. I know that. It's not just, you know, this isn't just some idle threat like you're going to get it when I get home. Yeah, this yeah. is bad. Right. And, and there's pure evil, which is what I had seen the day I walked in. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I um, I didn't tell. And then finally something came to a head and it was an argument with my parents. And they said something about if I didn't like it because I was tired of them trying to kill themselves, to be honest. And I'm, I'm being very direct, but that is the truth. And I just basically told them to grow up. And they said if I didn't like it, I could go back to the foster home. Well, of course, that just ignites like absolute fear because my, my mom and dad both know that if anything, I will, even if I'm annoyed with them, I would never leave my siblings. Yeah. Like it just wouldn't happen. It just, they were as much my children as they were theirs. Yeah. And so, you know, I taught my sisters how to read. I mean, it just, no. And so uh, that fast forward, I tell my mom and dad, they're indignant about what happened because the welfare had stepped in and told them how to raise their children. So instead of realizing that what I needed was support and compassion from them just to be my parents and just to go, it's okay they went on to this kind of a war path with this. And the next day, police show up and social services shows up at the school because they want to interview me independently of my parents. And mom and dad didn't really tell me what was going to happen. And I don't even know if they knew, to be fair. No, probably not, and, right? Right? And they didn't want them around when they interviewed me. Right. So I'm at the school. And, of course, now, remember, I'm a teenager. So I get called to the office. The police are in the office. Social services is in the office. I'm called to the office. I'm a teenager. No one wants to. So I'm, I'm being dramatic on the normal kid side. But I just, just to kind of put some perspective, when I walk in, I'm, oh, oh, oh right? Like, this yeah. is not going to be good. No, and everybody in the school knows now. And there's no keeping it a secret. And, oh, my God, yeah. Yeah, like, why is she in the office? Why are the police here? Blah, blah. I tell them what happened, and they say, you cannot lie about something like this. There are children that really, this is the best foster family we have in Penticton. There are children that have gone through this home, that need this home, and this is a really serious allegation. And, you know, you come from a, dis you know, a dysfunctional home. All the things he told me they would say if I told Every single thing he said they would say, they said. And they just basically said, shame on you for making up such a bad story. Like, oh, About you know. Upstanding people that. Yeah. Yeah. Like your life, I know that it's not ideal at home, but this isn't going to help you. And I shut down. I stopped. I didn't tell anybody after that. And that's, I was 16 then. At 19, they knocked on my door. And they, so I just, ha I've got married when I'm 18. 19, they show up and they knock on my door and they, uh, they, you know, two uniformed police officers. I'm living in the apartment building right next to the police station. No accidents. Um, I think, you know, I might not be telling anyone, but I'm making sure I'm close to somebody. Right. They knock, I go to the door, you know, in an apartment building, people drop in for coffee or whatever. I think maybe, or maybe mom even came to visit. Right. I open the door and there's two uniformed officers also need to know I have not told my husband I don't trust anyone to know the story right so I don't know anybody right so um they come in they say you know we'd like to talk to you about a person of interest you know Ernest Gardner and as soon as they'd say his name like now I'm fine but I'll tell you before when that name was said my stomach would get I just felt like I was going to get sick not and that day for sure because my husband 
is standing over to the side here. I'm with the wailing baby because I immediately go tense because I'm thinking my mom's committed suicide because right. my dad's already dead by now. He's taken his life. So this must be somebody in my family's hurt. Who's hurt? No, no, none of your family's hurt. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Poor Greg standing over here going, who are you? He's not saying it, but you know, the, yeah. like, who is this person I'm married to? And we're just young people. They come in, I give him, I said, I just need a few minutes to tell my husband, what <laughs> my happened? life, oh, you know, you've got five minutes to hear the story. I tell him, he's just sitting there like, like, and we're young. So how does he process? Right. Anyway, um, the police tell me they now believe my story. And the first thing that comes out of my mouth is why, why do you believe me? You don't believe me now because I have a little girl. You didn't come to give me flowers. Like, what's going on? Do you know Cindy and Susan Duff? Well, of course I know them. I went to school with Susan or to, with Cindy. And he said he has killed Susan. And I, if I had not been sitting, hun, that would have been, I, I would have, everything, like every part of me, even to this day, I've, re I've resolved that it is not my fault. But for the longest time, I just thought if I had just yelled louder, Susan would be alive. Like if they had, if I had said, listen to me, I might be from the wrong side of the tracks. I might be from wackadoodle. I might be from crazyville. I might look like a lot of things, but I'm a good student. I'm a good daughter. I'm, you know, I'm all those things. And yet here you are discounting me for this one person who it turns out had assaulted every girl that came through their home right right and some were extreme than others and his wife would just turn up the music so she didn't have to hear them screaming when he was raping them it was horrific what but happened it, you know <clears throat> i i get where you're coming from that that feeling of if i could have if 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 it was meant if it was your path it would have happened i mean i you know, know. <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> you can't you can't know that had you had you said anything more, I mean the onus. It, it what you're talking about there is it's the same thing that always happens to people who have been a victim is feeling yeah. that we should have done more or you should have done more. You should have said yeah. it in a different way. You should have tap danced when you said it. Come on, <laughs> the people yeah. who are who are supposed to be listening to you didn't do their jobs. They exactly. and it was a different time. You know, I I give them that, but it's not that long ago. I mean no. the the fact that somebody can establish a reputation in society can be the do-gooder like and and that means that everything else they do is is um is perfect we're yeah. all human i mean it doesn't matter how wonderful we are we still make mistakes but something yeah. like that i mean i i know you're not the only one this has happened to and but it i mean just to put it in perspective the importance of yes speaking out the importance of if if those maybe hindsight yeah. as an adult now you can look back and say well if i if you were advising somebody maybe you would say to them look if the, those policemen don't listen to you find another one if those oh, if sure. the, that teacher doesn't find someone to advocate for you is yeah. that what what you would recommend at this point i would and you know our system is still so broken and I'm not, this isn't a slam against law enforcement because I have family that are in law enforcement, like my in-laws are. And so I don't, I, I, there's no ill intent and, or is there any ill intent towards anyone in social services? Because you're, there's a couple of things that you already touched on. It was a different time. There wasn't the mechanisms. Mental illness was still ugh, stigma. I mean, there's still stigma. Let's yeah. be honest. It's yeah. better. But we still got it. I think we got 20, 30 years before we really just, you know, I just sidebar for a second. This is how I see mental illness. If you go and you break your arm today and I see you, I'm going to be the first person to say, can I sign your cast? Remember when we're little, yeah. that's everybody signs a cast, okay? When a person is not well mentally, instead of signing their cast, meaning showing support, we run the other way. Why don't we just sign the damn cast? Like, why don't we put our hand up and say, I'm here for you because mental illness is no different than a broken limb. In fact, it's worse by millions because it affects, you can't even function. It's not like I can take something or get my arm cast and then I'm okay. Do you know what I'm saying? And it's basic, but it's true. And there, this is there definitely, I mean, there has to be um, 
that's that's a place where you know um and I'm, I'm not trying to slam anybody either but i know that there's a lot more that has to be done i mean i grew up my stepfather had bipolar and uh, believe me i understand all mm -hmm. the whole dynamics of the secrecy and you can't tell anyone and you can't you know because um and and you know they're unfortunately guinea pigs for the pharmaceutical companies try this pill try that pill try that yeah. so we're a long way from um and I, I don't think we're you know he died in 2006 but i i don't see that we're that much further ahead so yes you've got the stigma and you've got the lack of actual dealing with it yeah. to you and know we're so still we're still turning a blind eye to a degree you know, it depends on the severity of how someone's doing. Mm -hmm. You know, we all, I mean, we both know people that have suffered severe depression, you and exactly. I. And the the truth is, it it's almost as though it's only, it's acceptable at this level and nothing more. Because we don't know how to deal with it. Instead of saying, it's okay, we'll figure it out. We we don't need to fix it. We just need to, to be, you know, we have to support. That's all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in the case of... Uh, you know, these people that had all been assaulted and everything else. And what happened with me, you touched on something else too, just sorry, going back to that. Uh, if we do one good thing in society, yes, we should be valued, but not with this blind faith. Give me a break. Now, he was classic. So was she. He was a scout leader and she was a brownie leader. It gave them opportunity to get to those girls, okay? And they were foster parents. And I'm not saying that a, a scout leader can't be a foster parent and be awesome or a brownie leader can't be a... I'm not saying that. I'm saying that we needed better systems. And now it is better and we still have ways to go, but it's better than it was when I was 15. I'm 53. Mm -hmm. So it's quite a difference, right? Yeah. So all that being said, you know, uh, in the end, he was blindly and she was blindly believed in that these people were very charismatic, which is classic of pedophiles or, or you know, uh, serial rapists and things like that. And so I wasn't believed. And so, you know, at 19, when they came back and they said, you know, Joe, we believe you. Yeah. Two things happened. One, I got really mad. Yeah. I mean, there's a little girl dead because you wouldn't listen. And not them specifically, but that I wasn't heard. And in my hands, I, I was holding my three-month-old baby, who's now wailing like a banshee. Yeah. Because I'm freaking out. And she can feel it. And, you know, it was chaotic. I can still remember perspiring. And it just, it was like a fountain. All of my body. Because all I could think about was, so is he going to find me? What's going to happen? And... Susan, and I knew the terror Susan had felt. I knew it because it had happened to me. Yeah. I, and she was only 12. And she hadn't come from the parent situation I came from. So she came from, you know, a little bit, I wouldn't say rough, but a little sort of middle area, different experience, okay? Okay. And all I could think about is what, she those last few minutes of her life and the fact that he left her on a hill to die and then no one found her for a month and, and not to be too graphic and I tell some of this in the story but I don't actually even really get into the graphics because I think we spend way too much time on the perpetrator yeah. and not enough on the voices of those who have been lost yeah and so wow what an amazing woman I am so impressed to be able to chat with Joe Dibley on Let's Get Real Chatting with Catherine, the author of Frock Off, Living Undisguised. And we will continue the story in part two, as well as give you the information on the different things that Joe is offering, ways to inspire you, to uplift you, to um, help you move into the life you really deserve. So join us for part two, a link right here on the YouTube channel uh, or on lgrcc.com. Until next time, Thank you take my care. Thank you for sharing with us today. Thank you for watching. Feel free to share the link. You can join us for live shows by going to Let's Get Real Chatting with Catherine.com and listen to the replays from the show page, preview guests, and explore links to our Facebook fan page, WordPress blog, and more. We are creating an exclusive world. Until next time, take care.